Well, we're going to jump into the Word this morning. If uh, you missed last Sunday, we started a brand new series called The Eyes of the Lord. The Eyes of the Lord. And we're talking about, there's this phrase in the Bible. Uh, it's actually four times. We'll read another one today. It says, the eyes of the Lord look. The eyes of the Lord searched. Weirdly enough, though God is invisible and though he has no physical flesh, Throughout the scriptures, he, referenced, he is referenced as he is, he is eyes, he is hands, he has feet, he has a mind toward us. He has physical characteristics, though he has no body. And one of the phrases that's in the scriptures multiple times is the eyes of the Lord are looking. And so as we kind of opened up last week, if you missed it, we're talking about, well, if God is looking for something, I want to be the thing that he's looking for. I want to be the person he's looking for, and I want to act how he is looking for the person to act. And so we're talking about these four verses that the eyes of the Lord look. The eyes of the Lord look. Last week we talked about the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth for hearts that are fully his. Fully his. So if you missed last week, jump on YouTube. We talked about God is looking for those that are heart, those hearts our hearts that are fully his. So this morning, we're going to keep going. Uh, if you want to have your Bible, go with me to the book of Luke this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's one right in front of you. You can grab that one, read. If not, no worries whatsoever. It will be on the screen right up here as well, so you can read with us. Luke chapter 19. You guys good? Anybody, does anybody at all actually care what the Super Bowl title is? Does anybody actually care? No. Not one person. <laughs> Everybody's like, what's the Super Bowl? It's Rihanna's show. Um, anybody going to watch the halftime show just for Rihanna? <laughs> Roxanne and Rihanna get the most cheers in church today. So <laughs> that's great. Luke chapter 19. We're going to read a, uh, a pretty famous story, a pretty well-known story. Um, if you've been in church, if you've not been in church whatsoever, uh, I will, I'll share a few thoughts for you um, out of this, uh, this story. Luke chapter 19. Here we go. Verse 1, it says, Jesus entered into Jericho. If you notice, we've been on the theme of Jericho. This is the third week in a row talking about Jericho. And he made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. If you were raised in church, remember the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he? Anybody? All nine of us that were raised in church. Just out of curiosity, how many for you in the room, like attending rows, is like your first time taking Jesus seriously? Like just show of hands, first time taking Jesus seriously. Awesome. Um, that's great. He... Zacchaeus, this individual, it says that he was a chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, a chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus. He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest at your home today. Zacchaeus climbed down quickly and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and great joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of this notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give away my wealth, half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. This is a wild response of Jesus. Jesus responded back and said, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. A true son of Abraham. For the, This is the phrase, here we go, for the eyes of the Lord. What is he looking for? For the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek. For the eyes of the Lord are looking, the same phrase, that the eyes of the Lord are looking for. What have I come for? Why am I here? Jesus says in one sentence, why am I here? I have come to seek and save. I have come to seek. I have come to look for those who are lost. What's interesting about the Bible, especially all the parables of Jesus, is Jesus, throughout the Gospels, tell these stories or this thing called a parable. A parable is simply a, a fable. It's a fake story that Jesus makes up 
to get across the point. But what's fascinating about all of Jesus' parables is all of them have multiple characters. Multiple. No story Jesus tells has one character. All of them have two, sometimes three, and there's always crowds and individuals. Now, this is what's amazing with these parables that Jesus is doing on purpose, is that he tells these fake stories to these people, multiple characters. Why? Because as we listen to the story, he's waiting to see which character we identify with. Because your identification gives away your self-revelation. So as he's telling these fake stories, he wants to see who we think we are in the story. And have you noticed when we read the Gospels, we are always the people Jesus speaks well of? And we're always on Jesus' side, yeah, get him, Jesus. But we're never the people Jesus wants to get, you know? Uh, and, and so he always tells these stories of multiple characters to see who we think we are. Because who we think we are in the story gives away how we see ourselves. The other end of parables is there are certain stories Jesus wants us to see ourselves as him and the people in the story. This morning we're going to read, we have read out of the story in Luke 19 about a famous man named Zacchaeus. As I saying, there's always been a fun song when we were kids, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Zacchaeus is a famous character in the story. Luke 19 is a very well-known story. But I want to, I wanna, if I can, in the next 26 minutes, I'm going to give myself a challenge. I want to preach two sermons to you out of Luke 19. Because I think this story is not just us identifying with Zacchaeus, but it's us identifying with Jesus. And I think we're actually supposed to be both simultaneously. And I'll explain to you how that works. Number one, let's look at the side of Zacchaeus. And I want to give three thoughts about Zacchaeus and three thoughts about Jesus that we are supposed to identify ourselves with. Number one, start with Zacchaeus. The Bible says that Zacchaeus is a short man, that he cannot see Jesus, that he hears through the crowd that Jesus is walking through Jericho on his way to the cross. This is one of the very last things Jesus will ever do before he dies. He's walking through Jericho to Jerusalem to die on the cross. The crowd is so big that short little Zacchaeus can't see him, but he can hear him. So he decides to climb a tree that he might get a look, that he might see Jesus. And they, him and Jesus have this interaction. But I'm gonna give you three thoughts in part one of this sermon. Number one is this. You didn't find Jesus, he found you. I think for many of us, we identify with Zacchaeus because we think we've climbed enough trees in our life that Jesus notices us. So we read stories like this and we're like, okay, Zacchaeus climbed a tree and got Jesus' attention. So I should start climbing some trees to get Jesus' attention. And we can completely miscontextualize this story that the Bible is challenging us to climb trees to get God's attention. And I would like to submit to you today, you can't climb enough trees to get God's attention. And every one of you have your tree. How we go to church, how we give, how we serve, how moral we are, how many scriptures we've memorized, how many old ladies we help across the street, how many neighbors we give groceries to. And if we're not careful, we can give Jesus, look at how many trees I've climbed. And no wonder Jesus noticed me. This is what's interesting about the story. Zacchaeus does not climb the street and start yelling, Jesus, Jesus. He doesn't do anything to get the attention of Jesus. He just simply climbs the tree to get a look at Jesus. And then what's the Bible say? Jesus notices him. Jesus looks up the tree and says, Zacchaeus, I see you. Now, this is what's amazing. There is a large crowd surrounding Jesus. But he notices one man. I think this story is so imperative to our walk with Jesus because if we're not careful, we think we're just some name in a crowd. We're just some name in the rest of Christendom that's following Jesus. I want you to understand today, and amongst the 8 billion people on this earth, Jesus knows where you are. Jesus knows your name. He knows where you're hiding. He knows where you're searching. He knows where you're looking. And amongst the crowd, he can look at you and say your name. 
that's actually my prayer today, that beyond my sermon, beyond the water baptism, beyond the worship, you hear Jesus say your name. Because you can be in this room and be like, yeah, this is great, but I don't know if Jesus knows me. And if you're not careful, you can sign up to a fake Christianity that thinks we're here to climb trees. And we're here to do things for God to get his attention. Friend, you can't climb enough trees to get God's attention. And this is what's amazing. Luke 19 starts with Zacchaeus searching for Jesus, but it ends with Jesus searching for Zacchaeus. This story is a chasm. It is a paradoxical reversing of the story. Isn't it like us? Our lives start with us searching for God. But as we search for God, we find out he was always searching for us. The story starts with Zacchaeus looking for Jesus, but it ends with Jesus searching for Zacchaeus. And what's the last sentence of the story? It says that I have come to seek and save. You have not come to seek and save me. I have come to seek and save the lost. Friend, you must pick up today. Every single one of us in this room, at some point in our lives, we were Zacchaeus. We were the one that was lost. We were the one that was searching and looking and finding and trying to get a glimpse of Jesus and how you have attempted to find a glimpse of Jesus. This morning could be your, I just want to get a glimpse. I'm here to watch my sister get baptized, but I just want to get a glimpse. I don't know where I think about Jesus. I just want to look. I just want a glimpse. Good news. Even while you're just taking a glimpse, while you're just taking a look, Jesus wants to call out and say your name. And he knows where you're at. But friend, um, those of you that were raised in church, don't you remember how all of this went wrong in the first place? So you must understand, I wish I had an hour and a half to preach every Sunday so I can do my due diligence, but the Bible wasn't, someone said, do it, don't tempt me. <laughs> don't, was, it, was that you, Lance? Don't you tempt me, Lance. <laughs> like, we don't care about the Super Bowl, we're here. <laughs> um, you got to understand the Bible was not a random collection of historical books conformed for some random reason. There's a theme, there's a motif throughout the entire book. One of them is the language of trees, weirdly enough. Do you remember going back to the book of Genesis, how all of this went wrong? Was a man and woman trying to do something with a tree to get God's attention? Don't you remember how Adam and Eve ruined this entire thing? As they took something from a tree to become like God, to get God's attention, and to be closer to God. And we have not come much farther than a few thousand years later. We're st we are still trying to climb trees and do the right thing to get God's attention. But friend, I have good news for you this morning. You can't find God. Even in our language, like, man, are you going to church? Yeah, I found God. You could barely find your way here without ways. <laughs> You've been here every Sunday for six months, and you still use maps. <laughs> you didn't find God. God found you. You didn't open up your intellectual double degree doctorate mind one day and then come to the realization, I found God today. You did not find God. Let us get our theology correct. God came searching for you. And it wasn't because you climbed that tree. So like, well, yeah, of course God found me. You see how much good work I was doing? Of course he found me. I was doing stuff to get his attention. Come on. Your tree is not that high. Your tree is not that equipped. For you to say that, look, look what I've climbed. and God, God found you. And every one of us, especially those of us that were raised in church, need to remind ourselves, God didn't find us because we were good. Have you ever like sensed that? That sometimes as Christians are like, well, of course he chose me. Come on. I, I don't know why he chose them. That's a story of grace. But this, this is a story of wisdom. <laughs> you know, like, 
Friend, I think every one of us in this room that have been raised in church our whole lives need to remind ourselves there is nothing on this earth we have done, we have said, we have given, we have tithed, we have served, we have sung, we have done anything to deserve Jesus calling our name. Jesus found us. You did not find him. Number two. 18 minutes. Okay. Okay. Unmerited forgiveness leads to unforced change. Unmerited forgiveness leads to unforced change. I love this story because the Bible says Jesus calls his name. Says, get your butt down, get off the tree, come down, see me. Jesus interacts with Zacchaeus, he comes down from the tree, and then Zacchaeus says, Lord, because of you coming to my home, I'm going to give away all, half my wealth. And if I've wronged anyone, which he's a tax collector, he's wronged everyone. That's their job. They're political figures that steal money from Jews to give them their money to the Roman Empire. They made a deal with the Roman Empire. So if Justin was coming by the toll and Roman Empire told me all tolls are $10, I would tell Justin, hey, the new toll for the Roman Empire is $15. Knowing I give 10 to Rome and five for me. Sounds a lot like the government. Um, come on, I'm just kidding. Um, he's the worst. He's hated by Romans and by Jews. He says to Jesus, because of what you've done, I'm going to do this. Wait, time out. I don't remember one time where Jesus asked him to do it. Jesus never said to the man, if you're really real about this, show me. If you're seriously committed to following me, prove it. If you're really forgiven, I'll see you at church next Sunday. If you're really passionate, I'll see you at Pursuit Thursday night. He does not say anything, ask anything, force anything, request anything. But because Zacchaeus has now earned or received unmerited forgiveness, which is undeserved forgiveness, unmerited, unearned forgiveness. The unearned forgiveness leads him to unforced change. I'm always weary of Christians that need to be asked to do things they should want to do. Because it shows me you've not comprehended your unmerited forgiveness yet. Because unmerited forgiveness should always lead to unforced change. I want to be at church every Sunday. It's like, well, how many can I miss to go to heaven? <laughs> well, like, how many do I get to go to still be a real Christian? We try to find the line and try to get as close as we can. Like, well, I am, I am a Christian because I go at least 15 Sundays a year. I give a little bit. I don't tithe, but I give a little bit. And I do this. I serve at least twice a year. I've, where's the enough? Where's the line of enough to make sure I get through the pearly gates? Unmerited forgiveness should lead to unforced change. And notice what he says. I'll do four times. Zacchaeus wasn't trying to find the line of enough. He was like, I want to do more than I would ever ask to be. I want to give more. I want to serve more. I want to love more. There should be something welling up in your heart when it comes to your relationship with God that he has done so much for you. He's forgiven so much for you. He has cleansed so much for you. I don't want to find the line. I don't want to do the enough. I want to do more than what is asked. Why? Because I want to. Not because I feel guilty if I don't. By the way, guilt is the worst meter of change. It's the worst. If you're changing based off your guilt, you'll be back in two months. But if you're changing based off the understanding and the, under, the understanding of your mind and your heart, that I've been, I've been forgiven how much? I've been given what? Oh, I want to do this. I'm weary of Christians you have to beg to do baseline things. Because it shows you have not actually comprehended your unmerited forgiveness. And by the way, salvation is always proven by change, not title. You can put John 3.16 John in your bio all you want. You can put the, the fish emblem on the back of your truck. 
You need to mark Christian on your taxes. Titles do not change you. You know what changes you? The unmerited, unearned, unforced forgiveness of God. And hear me, I want to leave that life. I want to leave what I was doing. Hear me, if there has not been I used to language with your net interacting with Jesus, I don't know if you've crossed the salvation line yet. There needs to be, yeah, I used to be that way. I used to talk that way. I used to think that way. No, no Jesus has changed my entire life. Well, did Jesus sit you down and force you? No, I wanted to. Did Jesus twist your arm? No. I wanted to leave that life. I wanted to leave that mentality. I wanted to leave that paradigm. I wanted to leave those ideals. I wanted to leave that relationship. I wanted to leave that bitterness. I wanted to leave that racism and prejudice in my heart. I wanted to, no, he didn't make me do anything. I wanted to. Why? Because I'm comprehending the unmerited grace and forgiveness I was given. Third, This double sermon's not going well. (laughs) Third, Christianity is not just about you coming to God's house, but him coming to yours. So what we make Christianity is like, oh, I'm going to start following Jesus. I'm going to go to his house, church, and I'm glad that you're here. That's a very baseline level of Christianity, though. Jesus does not just want you to come to his house. He wants to come to yours. (laughs) This is amazing. He, he, he receives salvation, right? Jesus says, this, this, this true son of Abraham, salvation has come to his home. It's almost like Jesus says, welcome home. No, go home. Welcome home. Welcome to the family. Welcome to Jesus. Welcome to salvation. Welcome to the family. Welcome home. Now go home. Jesus does not just want you to come to his house. He wants to come to yours. And I don't just mean like physical location. I mean like to your home, your family, your life, your relationships. I have found that so many Christians are okay with you going to God's house, but him coming to yours, I don't know about that. Because I got my life, my job, my girlfriend, my money, my thing, my, my future, my five-year plan, my degrees. I, I, got, I got my thing going here. I have no problem coming to his house, but him coming to mine, that's a Yes, he wants to come to your house. He wants to come into the center of your world, the center of your family, your relationships, your money, your ideals, your five-year plan, everything. Because you got to understand this. We serve a communal God, not individual. America has ruined the gospel on some level. And I mean that like I said it. We have made the gospel that Jesus is only after you. We... As if we serve an individual God. No, that's nowhere in the Bible. That's nowhere in the New Testament. We don't serve an individual God. We serve a communal God. What do I mean by that? Look through the entire Gospels. How many people Jesus saved while getting to their family? Look at how many siblings he saves. Look at how many homes he saves. A male back in the patriarchy in the early, 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 you know, first couple hundred years of what we're reading is when a male got saved. That's why Jesus says, salvation has not come to you, it's come to your home. Jesus does not say, Zacchaeus, you have received salvation today. He says, salvation has come to your home. Oh man, I pray our prayers would get raised. Jesus, don't bring salvation to me. Bring salvation to my home. Bring salvation to my mom, to my dad, to my siblings, to my cousins. Change my home. God is a generational God, not individual. He's going to be doing this for generation upon generation. And all of you that raised your hand and many more, like this is my first time being serious with Jesus, you are not making a personal decision. You're making a generational decision. You have no idea what you... Giving your life to Jesus means for your kids and your grandkids. Many of you are here because your grandma refused to give up. You're here because your grandpa refused to give up. 
Because God is into communal salvation, not just individual. Have you ever thought that you were the gateway to a line of generational salvation? Friend, your mom lied to you. It's, you're not all it. It's not all about you. Jesus didn't just save you for you. He saves you for your children, your grandchildren, your great. I, I don't want you to underestimate what you making a decision to fully follow God actually means for generations to come. It's not just about you. You might be the gateway or the portal or the opening to generational change. We talk a lot about generational curses and what's about generational blessings? I'm fully aware I'm here because of my dad and grandpa and great grandpa. I'm, I, I, I know why I'm on this stage. It's not because I was good enough for God to choose. It's because I had parents and grandparents and great grandparents that, put, that drew a line in the sand. It said for me in my house. Not for me in my life, for me in my house. We will serve the Lord. Now I'm on a tangent. It's not about you. And I know this is not what we want to hear. He's, he's choosing you to reach your home. And he wants to come to your home. Your home, your home, your home. Oh, hey, Josh. Second sermon, this is where I want to pivot the entire intro to my second sermon. Why does he want you to go home? Because too many Christians would rather go to the mission field than their neighborhood. Jesus, I'm in. Send me to Africa. I want you to just go across the street. Jesus, I'll build huts in Mexico. I'm in, Lord. How about you, like, go to your boss's house? How about, like, you reach your cubicle neighbor. How about like you start with Jerusalem? Why do we always pray for the ends of the earth but not Jerusalem? The Bible says in Acts, he will send us to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Why do we pray for God that sends us to the ends of the earth if you won't even go across the street? You think you're willing to go across the ocean but not across the hallway? <laughs> Why? Write this down. I have five minutes to land this whole crux of this message. You are not allowed to be saved and not sent. You're not allowed to be saved and not sent. Where am I being sent? Home. Oh, Jesus, I could do more work in India and in Africa and Mexico and Asia and the, how about you just go across the street? Why don't you walk across the hall? Why don't you go to your roommate and your dormmate and your classmate? Why don't you go to your sister? Why don't you go to your why don't you start in Jerusalem? Well, all my siblings are saved. Then go to Judea. Well, all my friends are saved. Then go to Samaria. What did Jesus say? Last sentence of the story. I have come to seek and save. What? The lost. Not the morally perfect. Not the ethically just. Not the spiritually intelligent. I've come for the lost. And I would like to just say, if that's what Jesus is, is looking for, that's what I want to look for. See, today we'll count how many people came to church, you know, roughly like this, how many people go to our church, whatever. While we're counting who's here, Jesus is counting who's not here. While we're counting seats and butts, he's counting empty pews. Well, they should be here, and they should be here, and they should be here. Have you, Hudson Taylor says this quote, so challenging. He says, if you're a Christian, either you are a missionary or a fraud. One or the other. He says, you are a missionary or a fraud. Because the core of Christianity is what? I'm a missionary. Where? To my neighbors? To my friends? 
I'm gonna do a series here real soon on heaven. I'm really excited about it. But I'm the old school guy that actually believes that heaven and hell are real places. I know it's not popular, but the Bible's not that popular. And I have to say what Jesus said. I actually believe those two places are real, eternal places. You are not allowed to be saved and not sent. Are you living a sent life? Like tomorrow morning, do you realize you're being sent to your work? You're being sent to your job? You're being sent to your school? You're being sent to your friends? You're being sent to your neighbors? Could you imagine if the 1,500 people that go to our church just got one person for the next 12 months, one person in church, our church would double to three? If the next year, every of one of those 3,000 people found one person in the year, we'd go to six and then 12 and then 24. We could change an entire state. If you just found one person a year, we're not talking about one person, I mean, I'm just one person a year. Why? Because I'm not allowed to be saved and not sent. And I've said all that, I have two minutes left to just say one sentence to you. If you do not have a heart for the lost, you do not have the heart of Jesus. Happy Sunday. If you're like, no, the loss isn't really my thing. I'm here to pray. You've missed the heart of Jesus. Well, the loss isn't really my thing. I'm here to worship. You've missed the heart of Jesus. You know, I don't really get along with unsaved people. We had, we had a family leave uh, a while back, a long time ago, because she said there's too many unsaved people at the church. <laughs> and I was like, that's the best compliment you've ever given me. I was like, ma'am, you have greatly confused why we do what we do. You think we're here to play Christian games and songs? Friend, you have greatly confused why we do this every single Sunday. It's not to get a bunch of Christians in the room to play patty cake in our intellectual Christendom. We are here that we might find the lost and build a room and build spaces for people that are far from God. We're here for the Zacchaeuses that are far, that are out there climbing trees trying to get God's attention. Jesus is like, why am I here? To seek and save the lost. So if that is what Jesus is looking for, that is what I'm looking for. If you don't have a heart for the lost, you do not have a heart of Jesus. That is Bible 101. Because Loving the lost, we've made into a church thing, not a Christian thing. I'm glad our church is, no, I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about our church becoming something. I'm talking about you becoming something. And if you're like, I have no unsaved friends, zero, I have zero unsaved friends, then friend, you've lied to yourself that you think you could be saved and not sent. Like, I don't interact with any unsaved people. I have no unsaved friends, no unsaved people in my world. What are we doing? You know what I'm looking for? I'm here to seek and save. Jesus says in one sentence why he's even here. You know what I came for? To seek and save the lost. You must understand, you are Zacchaeus in this story, but you're also Jesus in this story that's supposed to be helping find the Zacchaeuses in this world and bringing them to faith and bringing them to Jesus and helping them interact and have their lives changed by Jesus. Why? Because found people find people. Found people find people. And I hope, I hope this message, I'm gonna pray and get ready for water baptisms. I hope my words today are hitting the core of your soul. It's like, man, I'm, I've been missing why I'm even here. For I have come to seek and save the lost. 
If that's what Jesus is doing, if that's what Jesus is looking for, sign me up. Sign our church up. I'm tired of Christians blaming darkness for being dark. Do you know why rooms get dark? It's because lights leave. Darkness cannot create darkness in a room. Darkness only occupies where light leaves. And we can tell how dark this city is all day. Do you know why it's getting dark? It's because Christians are like, mm, it's too hard. What are we doing? Let's all move to Utah and Idaho and Texas and Florida. Cool. Let's go where everybody else is. Let's go where all the other lights are. Not me in this house. Not me and what we're doing. I'm here that darkness might be pushed back, that darkness might leave because a light is staying in the room. If Jesus is searching for the lost, so are we. I pray today something would happen in your heart toward lost people. The thems, they, I don't have them and theys, and I'm talking to those people in that group and those people and that social group and those type, I don't, those neighbors and that group and that. We don't have them and theys, it's us. We don't have theys. I don't mean pronouns, I mean like the, the thems. Oh, I, I don't talk to them. I don't hang out with those type of people. No, we, it's us. It's, it's, we're here to be a light. <laughs>